Hey Vinyl Community, it's Mazzy here, and I wasn't going to do a video today, but um, in the tradition of my ongoing series of artists, photographers, illustrators, designers, uh, I want to do one on Vaughn Oliver. Vaughn Oliver passed away uh, this weekend. I just uh, saw it this morning, read a couple of uh, bios and tributes and things, and I want to talk about Vaughn Oliver. Vaughn Oliver was a designer. He was from uh, Durham County in the, the UK and in the uh, early 80s is going to art school and like a lot of uh, students of the arts as an illustrator and designer he was very influenced by record covers of the time especially Roger Dean who designed all, a lot of prog work for Osibisa, Yes, um, you know his work, uh, Steve Howe and all that kind of prog bands and um, also was a big uh, fan of um, hypnosis and the designers who worked on uh, Paul McCartney and Pink Floyd and a lot of those things. So he thought that's, that's, that's for him. He wanted to be a designer. So this is a little tribute to some of uh, the albums and, and compact discs I have that Von Oliver designed. He had a company, he started a company. He um, worked with um, Nigel Grierson, who was a photographer and they worked under the name Envelope 23 initially. And their whole design philosophy was not to have an ego-driven thing like it had to be Vaughn Oliver or Neil. Uh, but uh, if you look on the, some of the early albums, they didn't all say Vaughn Oliver, they said Envelope 23. They worked together till I believe the late 80s or so, and then uh, Neil went on and did some other things, and Vaughn uh, sort of rebranded or read, uh, named his design from V23. So um, he hooked up. The thing that really kind of got him on the map was hooking up and, and being in-house initially with 4AD Record Company. So those of you who know uh, 4AD with the Cocteau Twins and the Pixies and and Belly and uh, from everything from Dream Pop to, to Punk uh, Rock, um, you'll recognize a lot of these album covers. Even the Red House Painters out of San Francisco. So um, Ivo Watts, um, Ivo Watts Russell was uh, the main partner for AD who brought um, Von Oliver on. And I'll just showcase uh, some of the LPs and then CDs. A lot of the stuff I initially bought on um, CD, because when you think about it from the late 80s into all through the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, the CD was sort of the go-to thing during the, um, the somewhat dormant uh, vinyl uh, time. So here we go. Again, I don't have complete sets of these things. These are some UK copies I have. This is the Pink Opaque by Cocteau Twins. And, the, and these photographs, again, were taken by Nigel Grierson. And sometimes they overlapped. Vaughn took some pictures and they worked on typefaces together and uh, different trees art treatments, but they had a very distinctive design, and I say I'm one who was really influenced by uh, this type of work and picked up a lot of these records, mainly because of the covers. Here's another one on 4AD, Treasure. Sleeve by 23 Envelope, again, uh, their design firm. Nice collaborative uh, effort. Again, like Strom Thurgeson with um, Hypnosis, the whole, whole team of designer photographers that really worked well together to design these things. Uh, Cocteau Twins were probably my first exposure for me personally, I believe, uh, and David Sylvian. David Sylvian, who uh, was in the band, uh, sort of the post-glam, pre-punk band Japan, who I saw first saw in 1978 in London, and then I got really into his sort of minimal, low-key vocal uh, treatments and things. I'm not going to talk too much really about the music because it's more about the designer. But this record in particular is my is my favorite of the uh, first batch of David Sylvian songs, uh, "Secrets of the Beehive." And especially there was a song that you know I never know he never had really a hit, but "Let the Happiness In" was probably the closest David Sylvian had as uh, to a pop hit at least I'm aware of. And I just love that song. I fell uh, in love with it and bought the, uh, bought the album and the CD. This was kind of the tail end of my uh, 
album line period for a while, 1987, this came out. And at that point, I kind of left LPs behind, with few exceptions for the next few years, and got into compact discs. And as I said, this is around the time in 1986, when I, in 85, when I first started getting into Von Oliver, I was just jumping in and getting into um, working with photographers and representing photographers. So in a little bit, I'm gonna kind of cross over and show you things that around that time that I was influenced in that worked, um, that I worked with, with designers and photographers. I'm not an artist, I'm not comparing myself to that, but it really kind of influenced me and I really um, was love of that style of work. Of course, in 88, this probably is one of his most famous. Um, this is the Pixies, and this is um, Rosa. What the, what's it called? Surfer Rosa, Surfer Rosa. There's a little um, controversy just because of the time uh, with nudity on the cover of records, which seems so provincial and so, you know, cutesy now in terms of people freaking out about that stuff. But obviously, you know, you couldn't get these in the chain stores at the time because they weren't having it. They weren't showing it. But um, this became a big cult album. Obviously, the record cover, uh, a lot of people picked it up because of the record cover, more the artistic sense of it, not the nudity part of it. And this is something where I'm going to switch over just in a moment and sh do a, a little um, showcase of some projects that I worked on that remind me of this period, because 1988 this came out. Uh, Von Oliver was really into really small typeface, which was great on albums, but was a bitch on compact discs. And those of you of a certain age, but most of you anyway, remember how all of a sudden you're trying to read friggin' liner notes. It's like Neil Young liner notes and script on all those CDs. You couldn't read them. Von Oliver, and there's a design school that happened in the late 80s. David Carson was another one. David Carson was a Southern California designer who worked on a bunch of uh, kind of post-punk surf magazines as well of, and album covers. That the type treatments, design treatments, overlays of type and photography and illustration and color schemes was just so amazing. But you couldn't fucking read this shit. But um, again, this is one of my favorites. And this is where... I got into something because at the time I was working with a photographer. I started working with my first photographer, Michelle Clement. And if you look at this cover, this treatment is done on Polaroid Type 55 negative. And that's why you see, if you've seen a lot of photography design, see the frame? That's the full frame of the Polaroid. If you know of photography, you would use Polaroid initially to kind of get your uh, image, lighting style, everything in order, and then you'd switch to film. So you'd test everything out on the Polaroid. If the Polaroid was fine, you'd go to shoot film for your project. But obviously a lot of artists, especially in the 80s, it got to be a big thing. We're working with uh, Polaroid as original artwork. And what happens with Type 55, it's a four by five format. And what happens is when you peel the backing of the Polaroid away, that backing would be a negative. And a lot of photographers, including, um, uh, what's his name? This is, um, I'll get his name in a minute. Oh, Simon Larbestier. Simon Larbestier is the one who took this and most of the Pixies covers and a lot of the later uh, V23 covers with Von Oliver. And this is, again, the Type 55. You peel that away and you'd use that negative as to make prints from or as an original. But usually, that's why you see the whole full frame. A lot of time, they would crop in, but then the aesthetic, people would like that frame. In fact, we're gonna go over here. And I've showed you some of this in other videos. I worked with Michelle Clement on a series of records. Not that I worked on them, but I did kind of the collaborative negotiating with Blue Note Records, which was part of Capitol Records on a series of albums for Tony Williams. These are just four of them. Uh, the first one that came out in 1988, the same year as um, the same year as that um, first Pixies Rosa album was this Native Heart. I'm sorry, Angel Street. Got this confused. And you can see a little bit of the full and edges of the Polaroid. 
And this is a body nude, double imaging of Polaroid, two four by five negatives sandwiched together. And this is before Photoshop. So uh, Michelle and a number of artists were working doing this kind of montage type of work before you could do it in Photoshop and everyone and their sister uh, did that kind of work. You can see film, uh, similar uh, styles of design. Uh, this was designed by a San Francisco designer, a few of these, Tom Bonaro in San Francisco. And again, small type. And this just happens to be a coincidence in a time period, very similar that, um, of what the kind of design John Oliver did. Excuse me, not John Oliver, the comedian. Von Oliver. I'm going to start getting into um, British kitsch of John Oliver, anti-Trumpinian. Uh, uh, anyway, you won't go there. But you want me to go there, don't you? Not for this video. Anyway, um, beautiful design, but let me take you over here. Because this is a, 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 a print, a fiber-based print that Michelle took of um, the original print for the uh, Angel Street album cover. It just shows that. And I show this because I want, th this was a sort of uh, style that was happening in the late 80s. And again, another one, similar type treatments that Tom Bonaro did and Michelle Clement did the photography of jazz drummer Tony Williams. And a, uh, a live in Tokyo CD. And then lastly, um, this was 1980, I believe. This is the one, I've sent a few of these out to VC members because I had a box of them. Uh, this is Native Heart. This is the one I was thinking of. And I've said this before, but some of you haven't watched this before. Very similar in style to the Von Oliver treatment of design and photography that Michelle shot. This is one where, unlike the Pixies, they wanted to get into some more stores, even though jazz is not a, a big seller like that. So the nipple was uh, airbrushed out in this they put it in shadow so unfortunately can't show a nipple in walmart and best buy and i have no, no no idea but look at this design and look how small that type is so it works wonderfully on an album but um not so great on a compact disc and this is on blue note records this is when tony had his own uh, quartet quintet quartet anyway cover design by tom bonaro again michelle clement the photographer so back to Von Oliver, um, Doolittle with the Pixies, uh, same photography team of Simon Laborestier and Von Oliver. This is at envelope when he had envelope 20, I'm sorry, this is when he had V23. Just beautiful design. I love this stuff. Okay, let me kind of, kind of move a little forward quicker here. I'm going to switch to some CDs. This is a box set of the Cocteau Twins, compact disc. The box set of CDs of 12-inch um, singles, EPs, and 45s. Now, he didn't do every project, so I'm going to kind of go through and pick and choose on some of these. And hopefully um, my friend here can kind of focus in on it. I'm not going to pull these out because these don't have the really uh, books inside, elaborate books inside. But it, you know, the, the covers emulate that dream pop ethereal style, which is really beautiful. You pretty much get what you see in the artwork with their um, their green pop. Some are just more graphic than uh, ethereal, as I showed in that um, David Silverman Silverman cover. Uh, Nigel photographed a lot. Nigel Grossman photographed a lot of organic things: feathers, rocks, dirt, sand, a lot of background surfaces. Well, I think I have one more here. That's pretty um, representative of the style they were working on at the time. So, cool limited edition box of Dream Pop Cocteau Twins singles. 
I wanted to show this, and then I realized uh, Von Oliver didn't design it. I'll just briefly show this because this is called um, Box of, what is it called? Box of something here. Earth, oh, Weather Box, Weather Box, David Silvium. This is a collection, a nice, beautiful uh, design box, not of Von Oliver design, but School of, but it does include uh, Secrets of the Beehive, uh, Gone to Earth, some of the uh, projects, some of the albums that uh, Von Oliver worked on. They were kind of redesigned and reformatted. So there's some things in here that emulate Von, but um, again, I, I could have sworn it was Von, but it wasn't, so sorry about that. I've watched Ross, Russell, again, of 4AD, also uh, came up with this concept of this sort of phony group, almost like a super group in a way. Had a lot of people from the Cocteau Twins and a lot of the 4AD artists that put several albums, it was a three or four albums under the name This Mortal Coil uh, in the 80s as well. I don't have the LPs, but I have this wonderful limited edition box set that's apparently really hard to find right now. This Mortal Coil in 1983 to 1991. And what's great about this, it has the three albums. It'll end in tears, filigree and shadow and blood. And the fourth compact disc are the original versions. And what's interesting about this is the music, or the this Mortal Coil did all covers. And they did sort of this dirgy like kind of uh, music covers by, let's see here. Covers by artists like The Talking Heads, Tim Buckley, Peter Newton and Michael Brook, Pearls Before Swine, The Birds, I'm the Cosmos by Chris Bell. You know Chris Bell. A couple songs by Chris Bell from um, Chris Bell, Big Star. There you go. Guy. Uh, Amy Lou Harris. Nature's Way, uh, The Spirit Song, and a Gene Clark song, Strength of Strings. So a lot of kind of moody, again, dream poppy type things. I know they just reissued uh, this past year these records on vinyl, so uh, you might want to check them out if you are um, have an aversion, or not an aversion, an attraction to that type of music. So This Mortal Coil, highly recommended if you're in that moody kind of genre. But again, Von, great Von Oliver, Von Oliver. I didn't show you all that design, did I? I can get in here. I mean, mostly inside the book is, I think, more type side, but he worked with these photographers as well. But it's got, that was, again, when I was crossing over to show the work of Michelle Clement, when I first started uh, representing photographers, the first Aside from my still life and food photographers, the first three photographers I worked with, um, a big portion of the work was very black and white, artsy, moody work. David Allen Brandt, Christiana Sapis, and Michelle Clement had this really ethereal uh, thing using Polaroids and black and white uh, treatments. They worked with photography and in the dark room, again before Photoshop, doing custom uh, prints and uh, developing processes, printing processes sepia tone printing, selenium tone, split tones. Um, I always thought it's so ironic where, you know, a lot of photographers like, like Ansel Adams was really a pioneer of nature and Yosemite and California and the nature thing. And photography, especially with Polaroids and chemicals, is such a toxic, uh, I want to say sport, but a toxic hobby or documentation. So in a way, the digital thing, even though it, it took away, it's kind of like organic or like analog versus digital. There's a similar thing with uh, uh, analog photography, I guess you could call it, uh, printing, processing the negative, and um, now with digital, you can do things on Photoshop as well. So I just wanted to stress that. And um, anyway. We'll take it from there. We'll be back right after this. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, but in the background, very lightly uh, low, low levels of volume in the background. I'm showing this Heidi Berry album. It's one of, one of my favorite uh, Von Oliver covers. Heidi Berry was on 4AD, obviously, because that's pretty much uh, most, I don't think exclusively after in the end, but um, 
beautiful books of artwork, photography. This is where when you see this kind of stuff, as wonderful as it is, you really miss LP size, right? I'm not go I don't go back and buy all of the album covers over again. Occasionally I do uh, with the Pixies, with those Polaroid transfers, not Polaroid transfers, Polaroid uh, negatives. I just really had to. So um, this is a beautiful, again, it's, it's very reminiscent of uh, Heidi Berry's, a little bit reminiscent of the late 60s, early 70s UK folk scene going on, you know, with um, Maddie Pryor and um, Sandy Denny, Pentangle, those uh, type of artists. It has that kind of folksy feel to it, but nice record. Not in any particular order. This is a 12 inch single, is it? EP maybe, Belly. I go to pull them out so they don't reflect. Belly. coming. More semi-dream pop-ish a little bit. Um, again, I'm not getting into the big music description, but this is that period in the, like the 90s, I guess, right? Um, 95. I was really into this whole 4AD thing. A lot of, it's one of those labels that sometimes you trust a label so much that you pick up everything. I mean, it could be Something like our Hooli and Roots music on one level, it could be Apple Records, Beatle related. Eh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, 4AD is definitely a label like that, and there's there's countless others where you just you just love it what they're putting out, what they're curating so much, and it's pretty wonderful. Um, one group they did a lot with, and I realized the box that I have was not in, uh, designed by Von Oliver, and I don't have their separate earlier albums. I only have that comp that wasn't design was Dead Can't Dance. And Dead Can't Dance is like the perfect kind of thing that that, that sound, that dreamscape, that um, world music. And uh, But this one was designed by Von Oliver. And this is Lisa Gerard, an album she did with Pieter Bork, Pieter Bork, um, from 1998, again on 4AD. Beautiful design. Lisa Gerard is an artist that I just fell in love with initially because of Dead Can't Dance. And then after that, um, I mean, even she did the, you know, she's on the soundtrack of um, Gladiator, a beautiful soundtrack and some classical things. Um, but anyway, Lisa Gerard, promo copy. <coughs> My videographer just coughed. So continuing on, uh, the amps, another 4AD act. Uh, 4AD, I won't get into the whole details of the label. Uh, this was designed by Von Oliver, V22, again, V23. And 23 tends to be my lucky number, not tens, is. So there's a little uh, kumbaya thing. And turns out Von Oliver was born in uh, early September, so we're both Virgos. There you go. And he's three years younger than me. So it just, it hits a nerve when someone, you know, great artist that you admire and you've kind of grown with, even though obviously I didn't know him. And I did see him once at the design center in um, the big, big blue whale. If you, if you're any of you from Los Angeles or the LA area, know the design center uh, in uh, Los Angeles, the big blue whale, the design building. I saw a talk that Von Oliver gave and there was a showcase of his work. There are several books of his work. I don't have them. Um, of course, now you want to get them when you get into this, but still, I have a lot of the work. So, uh, again, there you go. Someone about my age passing away. I don't know how he passed away, but um, it kind of makes you revisit these artists a lot. Um, the Breeders. Breeders, I believe, was Kim Deal, who was in the um, Pixies. 
and she went on. Uh, Pixies were out of Boston. Uh, the breeders were kind of based and really grew out of Ohio, and I don't know all the details who came from what thing. I don't know that kind of thing, but again, more beautiful design by um, V23. This is the one I wish I, I needed. I want to get this on, oh, on vinyl, excuse me. I think this is a beautiful, beautiful cover. Last Splash by the Breeders. Let me see who took, oh, look at these. Just beautiful, almost psychedelic covers. Very rich. Again, it's kind of moved away from some of the monochromatic late 80s stuff that he was doing with um, Neil and putting together on some of their records. Organic things, a little less organic, but nonetheless, um, just as beautiful. And again, one of those little things that's so small, it's hard to read to read it. Um, photography by Jason Love. I suppose that's Jason Love. Hard to read in these little books, right? What a, what a pain in the ass. Thank God vinyl's back. And um, this, to me, is not representative of all. Now, some of the things I've showed you here were from uh, V23 Studio. And especially in the late 80s into the 90s and beyond, it wasn't just Von Oliver. I mean, a lot of studios I've worked with, and I, I'm, I assume with um, V23 as well, have several designers. Obviously, uh, the primary, the hero, if you... I mean, I guess I could call him the hero. The boss, Von Oliver, oversees things and probably approves and nixes things that don't fit with the sort of design aesthetic. But once you uh, hire designers in your... Uh, group, a lot of times there is a look that comes out of some design firms. And again, we're talking about this type of work where they work with record companies a lot. Going back to my thing uh, in the late 80s, when I got into this, having been in the record business before, obviously to get my photographer's work, I had to go more commercial and go to advertising agencies and design firms and things. But one of my personal interests, having worked in the record stores, was going to the labels. And that was a time in the late 80s and even in the, in, into the mid-90s where a lot of record companies had decent budgets. So I was able to work with Blue Note and Capital and Electra Records and Columbia Records, and which, which became Sony, and Warner Brothers. Uh, not a lot. It wasn't a primary thing, but I liked it, even though maybe the, uh, the budgets weren't as good as advertising. They were pretty good, again, depending on the artist. If you do something for a big-name artist... The budget for the packaging and the cover is a lot. When you're working for someone, um, you know, a newer artist, you don't always have a big budget. It just depends on uh, wh what they're rolling out and their expectations, too. So that matters. At the end of the uh, 90s, mostly into the 2000s, as the you know music business really changed, in my particular case, what shifted big time in the 2000s was... I, my artist hardly did any of that record cover business because the budgets were few and far between. So unless you had, if you had an A-list artist, basically a big name artist, they would go with the big name celebrity photographers, the Matthew Ralstons, the Herb Ritz, the Annie Leibovitzes, uh, the Albert Watsons, and you know, fashion celebrity portrait photographers. And that was more LA, New York, you know, France and London based. Uh, so we were kind of in that middle area or they went for friends of the band. So when the bands grew up, like, you know, a band like REM or any, any band, Talking Heads, the artists were, who came from art school worked with other people they grew up with and they started designing and photographing the band where it wasn't about the budget, their friends or their co collective, if you, if you will, uh, would work on these records together. So that's kind of my personal take on why this all matters to me and why I like to showcase um, designers. Lastly, why don't you come over here? Lastly, I'm going to just show you a, a, the, the last band. Oh, before I forget, these are very non reminiscent of uh, the whole Von Oliver experience. Although Von o Oliver did work on these, these are uh, Frank Black when he went solo before the Catholics and after uh, Pixies. I actually love these records and they're 
I mean, if you look at, if I looked at these, well, I am looking at these, I'm looking at them. I would not think of the Von Oliver design, although designers shift and evolve. They need to, artists have to um, really shift. I didn't mention uh, his influences before. One of his also influences, which you notice more in his early work, Von Oliver's early work, was Salvador Dali. He was, uh, uh, you know, from the school of uh, the uh, Surrealists. So anyway, I just thought I'd showcase these because they're kind of fun records. Well, 4AD again, great graphics, right? But again, unlike the uh, Von Oliver I showed earlier. And lastly, he worked on these and not all the same uh, photography and design aesthetic. However, the Red House Painters. I've showed you things by Mark Kosalex before. I'm a big fan of the dirgy San Francisco sound of the Red House Painters. Um, Songs for a Blue Guitar, beautiful record. Again, not, it's not, these aren't danceable. These are just moody, somber, ethereal, gorgeous records. And I did show this on another video, but I need to show it here. This beautiful set that includes Red House, Red House Painters, Down Colorful Hill, Red House Painters, Ocean Beach, a little more minimal in style. Again, if uh, Von Oliver didn't design all these, I might be surprised, but I think his design firm did work on these as well. This is Ocean Beach. I mean, the photography and the design of this is beautiful. A lot of, again, very black and white, organic. Um, I know Mark Kosalix had a lot of input in these too. Another thing I didn't bring up, which is really important to me, um, having read and studied Von Oliver over the years, he was fortunate enough when he worked on all the 4AD artists, he got in early in the process. He got to talk to the artist, work with the artist. It wasn't just things like most labels where the art department is a separate thing and they consult maybe a little bit unless the artist is well established, has a name. Von Oliver would get uh, demo tapes of the music months before the final albums were finished. He'd study the lyrics, he'd listen to the music, get a feel for it, and then he would talk to the artist. In fact, he used to say, that as much as he loved working initially with the early artists like the Cocteau Twins, and this is really surprised me, and uh, the British bands, he said once he started working with the Pixies and beyond, the American artists were more receptive to the artwork and wanted to talk about art and design and the cultural significance of the photography. I would have thought it'd be the opposite in a way, but um, here's another Red House of Painters on 4AD. Beautiful photography. This is a beautiful print. I love this. And one of my favorites, Red House Painters. Great song. Grace Cathedral is on here, Roller Coaster, Strawberry Hill. So, um, this is, um, I'm taping this on uh, the end of uh, December, I think it's December 28th or 29th. Let's look, it's December 29th. 2019 and this is a tribute to the great great designer von oliver who passed away this weekend just saw it when i woke up this morning and i had to do this right away because i love to showcase the artists who work with the artists sort of the music who work with the musicians that's a big part of why i like doing this why i like showing the visuals on these things so um hope you're you know i'm sure a lot of you have seen these album covers at least some of them but now you're aware um, where they came from and who designed them so my toast, I don't have a cocktail or a coffee or anything, but, um, oh, I do have a, a juice, a juice to, not John Oliver, to Vaughn Oliver, rhymes with John Oliver, 
to John Oliver, and uh, thanks for watching Vinyl Community and other uh, art students and art artists out there. Mazzy loves you. Cheers. Cheers.